you can further subdivide the neocortex into a number of different specialized brain areas. And these are often referred to uh, using the nomenclature from Brodmann, um, who discerned these different anatomically defined brain areas based on the thickness of those different six layers that we talked about in chapter three of the neocortex. And so all these different areas have different relative proportions of the superficial layer four and also the deep layers of the neocortex. It's interesting that form follows function. With the advent of modern neuroimaging techniques, people have been able to determine more accurately what the function of each of these different areas is. And they, there are typically discernible differences between what each of these different areas are doing, although the mapping is not precise. And certainly many things could be happening within one area and each area is contributing to multiple things. So again, the principles of distributed representations that we talked about in chapter three remain very relevant, but there is some degree of functional specialization as well. We will not be going into a lot of detail about these different brain areas. Let me just point out a couple here though. So area 17 is primary visual cortex or V1. And we'll certainly talk a lot about that in our perception chapter. And as things go up into these two different pathways, the ventral and dorsal pathway, you can see different areas of the parietal lobe the temporal lobe, uh, and then it goes up into these different frontal cortical areas. And so obviously these back areas of the brain uh, radiating out from vision are associated with vision uh, and then higher level areas and motor cortex and prefrontal cortex are important for motor control. Those are some really basic divisions. But let's try to understand a little bit more in detail about why these different parts of the cortex may have different functional specializations. And one really interesting way of trying to understand this is kind of like a follow the money approach, except in this case, we're following the activity. Okay, so we start that trail anchored at these critical points where primary sensory information enters the neocortex. This is conveyed through projections that come through the thalamus and then before that, from the actual sensory transducers. So in the, in the case of vision, your eyeballs send synapses through the retinal ganglion projection into the uh, lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, and that goes then up into primary visual cortex. We saw that area 17. And from there, it determines a lot just by kind of following this activity that flows out from this primary source of visual information. Likewise, we have a primary source here in temporal lobe, in the superior temporal lobe for auditory information. Uh, midline areas here uh, associated with somatosensory information. So S1 is the primary somatosensory cortex. And right across the central sulcus is the primary motor cortex. Now this is not an input, but rather an output. So this is the one case where the anchoring is actually uh, on the output side of things. So how does this work? Well, let's take the case of vision. Uh, you get all this visual information coming in. And what we now know is that it flows really into these two different pathways down into the temporal lobe and up into the parietal lobe. And the functions that, that emerge from that flow of visual information are kind of anchored by what else is going on in each of those different cortices. So if we look in the case of temporal lobe, we can see that this primary auditory cortex is gonna be really important for speech recognition, especially in the human brain, obviously. And so you can sort of think, well, hmm, if I'm making connections between visual information and speech information, words, that's gotta be where language takes place. And indeed, we now know that language is very much specialized in these pathways that lie in between the visual input and the auditory input, forming that bridge or connection between those two primary modalities of language, vision and audition. And then interestingly, and not coincidentally, we think our understanding of the nature of objects is also in this same kind of general pathway. Uh, we know a lot about uh, objects through 
our language representations of them, names that we associate with different objects, categories, all of that shapes how we understand the visual world. And so this overall forms the what pathway of vision, uh, identifying what it is that we're looking at, giving it a name, understanding it at that kind of category level. And that then flows up into these kind of higher level notions of semantic knowledge, what kind of abstract categories are there, peace, justice, truth, these, these much more abstract, hard to visualize uh, terms may live up in the anterior temporal lobe. And again, following this notion of a, a hierarchy of abstraction going from more concrete visual representations uh, closer to the primary visual input, and then going up into these more abstract areas as we get higher up. As we go down and wrap around into the medial portion of the temporal lobe, that's where we enter the hippocampal region um, and interconnect our understanding of what we're seeing, who was there, what did we eat, these kinds of facts that go into the episodic memories enter in from this temporal lobe and wrap around into the medial temporal lobe and form this basis of episodic memory. Now if we go and do that same kind of track tracing here, but think about the influences that shape this visual information as it flows up into the parietal lobe, we get a very different picture. Here we can think about motor functions and the ability to use visual information to predict what is the outcome of a motor action that I'm going to take, how, how, where should I reach, where should I look, these kind of sensory representations that tell us how to guide our motor control, that's what we think is going on in the parietal lobe. And so we have these notions of action, space, the 2D space, the 3D space that we engage in, in for representing actions. And these kind of notions of space then shade into more abstract representations of number and time. And it's very interesting that, that these more abstract notions kind of build on these more concrete sensory motor representations that develop early on, just enabling us to do these very basic things of reaching and looking. Those then provide the foundation for these higher level abstract concepts of number and time. Another interesting case there is relationships and the ability to know like something is above something else, left of, right of, forward, back, and then also that becomes very important for numerical relationships, greater than, less than, time, earlier, earlier, later, all of these concepts live, as we know, from neuroimaging studies and other sources of information in the parietal lobe. So a very general way of thinking about this also that's interesting is that the parietal lobe tends to represent things that lie along continua, these kind of more continuous spaces, harder to kind of latch onto. And it's interesting that we don't really have a, a lot of good conscious awareness of what's happening in our parietal lobes. We're much better at consciously accessing what's happening in the temporal lobe uh, we can think about what object we're seeing that's very concrete and discrete, but kind of trying to teach somebody a motor skill, if you've had that experience, you know that it's extremely difficult to articulate verbally and consciously, how is it that I know how to ski down a hill? It's very hard to understand, and yet we know that that's all supported by these kind of flowing continuum kind of representations in our uh, visual uh, dorsal pathway here, the motor control pathway. And so there may be a very important difference in, in what we're consciously aware of. And interestingly, there's been some research showing that when we experience visual illusions, we experience them as the temporal lobe experiences them. But if you probe those same visual scenes using motor actions, the motor system is not actually susceptible to those same illusions. So that's interesting. That's one source of interesting evidence that there are really these different kind of pathways and different ways of processing the visual information. But again, this overall idea of just kind of following the flow of activity allows us to really understand the broad functional organization of the brain. Broadman's area, discrete kind of chunks, is probably not the most accurate way of thinking about it. Thinking it, about it more in terms of these continual like flows of activity from one place to the next is probably a more accurate way of understanding what's happening in the brain.